Watching NewsX, my name is Vineet Malhotra, Indian conglomerate where Vedanta has signed a pact with the electronics manufacturing services giant Foxconn to form a joint venture for manufacturing semiconductors in India. Vedanta is the first company to make the announcement to invest in semiconductors manufacturing after the government announced a rupees 76,000 crore program to boost electronic chip and display ecosystem in the country. This is also the second attempt of Vedanta to enter the semiconductor space after its earlier plans to set up a display unit with about rupees 60,000 crore investment, which obviously did not take off. But this is big news coming in. This is definitely something that uh, the Indian market will cheer to, as well as the world market will also be elated about because uh, the shortage in the supply chain, specifically related to semiconductors, is also something which will be taken into account and computed as a result of this uptick. Joining us on the program is uh, Professor Aman Agarwal, Director of uh, Indian Institute of Finance. He's also an economist. Yogendra Kapoor, Senior Economist, is also joining us on the program. Arun uh, Vamfazi, Semiconductor Professional and Author, is also here with us. Joyita Basu, Editor of the Sunday Guardian, is also joining us on the program. Joyita, let me start by asking you a simple question. You know, this is a move a joint move between uh, India and Taiwan, but you know, it will have a set of challenges as well. Internal challenges, you know, perhaps is something that uh, we can do with, but at a time when there are fresh tensions between India and China, how is this going to pan out for both the countries that already see themselves in a standoff? Uh, well, Vineet, I think when it comes to any investment coming, you know, uh, and especially anything related to Taiwan, China is very sensitive, as we have seen. Uh, what has been happening? There is, you know, very mysterious uh, incidents have been taking place in certain or in many of these uh, firms, especially in South India. And I think Pune also it happened. Uh, Wistron, it has happened. Remember, sudden flare up of uh, these labor trouble is happening. And you see, so there is a lot of speculation in terms of what kind of influence, what kind of external influence is trying to paint India as a bad investment decision, I mean, destination. And if we are looking at, in fact, what a, a huge attempt, as we know, as journalists, we know that, you know, that a huge attempt is going on uh, to show India as a very poor investment destination. And it's a socially unstable. It is a cauldron of hate. You know, what is happening, everything, every all the troubles that happen in terms of every, even the smallest incident happening in India gets magnified manifold internationally. Okay, even though, say, for example, it is Canada that is actually under emergency right now. And, you know, and thing is that we have, we are talk, uh, told that it is uh, democracy is sliding in India. So what happens ultimately, it is not just about blackening India's name, ultimate aim is to ensure that industry doesn't come to India. Okay, so actually the minute something like this happens, and earlier also many companies, say for example, Samsung, I think they shifted their uh, screen making, large screen making uh, factory uh, operation from China to India. And the more companies diversify, the more uh, stress mm -hmm. we start giving in terms of supply chain resilience, it's but natural that these movements will start happening. But we have to watch out for the external enemy. Hmm. All right, the external enemy. Well, this is one way of, uh, you know, putting forth the fact that India wants to get ahead in the semiconductor market. But Professor Agarwal, you know, this is a situation which has not uh, been prevalent in the country before. You know, we have made attempts to have the semiconductor platform uh, escalated and, you know, uh, sort of uh, energized in the past as well. Why do you think this is going to work this time around? A, of course, what I think is that the government is backing this up completely, but there are other problems, some of them which were also pointed out by Joy Tabasu. Please unmute yourself. Uh, I said there is a clear cut. Uh, what you pointed out is very correct in terms of the government uh, initiative and backing up. Because you see, the government here is interested, and that's where it will create a platform and a pathway for the industry to perform and, and excel. And because that's become an 
as you know, about ten million dollars were even uh, for, you know projected for uh, industries wanting to seek in into the semiconductor industry uh, even last year. So there is a clear mandate, there is a clear structure. As far as Taiwan, the concern raised by my colleague just now, the Taiwan and China, although it's Taiwan and China, but Taiwan and China don't see eye to eye. And there's a lot of difference between uh, what comes in between Taiwan and India and against China and India. You see, Taiwan, as a matter of fact, has been uh, in the Asian Tigers framework for almost 20 years now, one of the leading producers of uh, second level kind of chip structures, uh, semiconductor electronic products and, and uh, even, uh, you know, uh, you know, computer based electronic chips, uh, uh, you know, motherboards and all. As a result, and we have been purchasing a large chunk of those uh, products directly as a buyout from uh, Taiwan from time to time. It's not new. We have been buying large number of Indian industry has been buying. Now, this initiative, I think, is a good match because, first of all, we have a huge requirement because we are lacking that. As a result, if there are supply chain disruptions, we'll see an extensive price rise in such products which is there and we will not be able to meet and meet the requirements which the Nirmala Sitharamanji has talked about in our budget in terms of digitalization, creating digital frameworks, platforms and various other things which she has mentioned uh, in terms of inducing in this uh, in the country. 2022-23. Now, if we want to do that, we need to set up such kind of structures where there could be joint plants, where one brings in the technology, the, the, the know-how, and we give them the platform to go about doing it. And in this process, building a resilient industry. Fortunately, India in the last almost 70, 80 years, I would say, has shown to the world a large number of companies from overseas have come into India, are performing well, are repatriating profits to their countries in Europe and in Asia and all parts of the world. So the fact that, you know, they are able to do so and go forward and even joint ventures have performed. Marutu Suzuki is a perfect example of a joint venture which came up and has been a successful structure in this country since the beginning, even today and exporting extensively worldwide. So I think the market is there. It's a question of not only creating those products for India, but even value adding them and supplying to the rest of the world and earning foreign exchange reserves for the country. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a good move. It is something which is required and I'm happy that it is done now because we are facing a huge chunk of supply chain disruption in terms of semiconductors and, and other similar electronic products, which I think in due course in a short span of time, because this is not an industry which requires a huge uh, panel failure, which may take a year or two. It can be set up in a much faster pace, given the fact that Vedanta has already a framework and a requisite infrastructure, which could be put to use in terms of bringing in this joint venture on ground. So in my opinion, this is a very good win-win uh, go situation. And I think with the government support, as you rightly pointed out in the beginning, we should see it fly off fairly well. All right. Well, good points there, Professor Agarwal. Uh, Yogendra, if you can hear me. Yes, yes, very much, Vineet. Uh, Yogendra, you know, the uh, semiconductor market and uh, the adjoining supply chain, which is predominantly, basically, running the world, is in uh, disruption today. Do you think that India has the opportunity, has the capability and the support as well to become the center of the world, not literally, but when it comes to the supply chain dissemination market scenario, India has this opportunity to replace China, Taiwan, and even the Americans for that matter? Absolutely, Vineet. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome this development that has taken place. Now, I would like to go into the past challenges that have taken place in this country as to why our country has not been able to get into chip manufacturing uh, business uh, as such. Uh, there have been three major challenges. The first one is the amount of huge investment that is required in this kind of a project. The second is the power and water utilization, the quality of power, the quality of water and the supply part. They have been the major challenge in this country in the past. The third is the infrastructure as well as the government support in the past, which has been lacking. So in all, these were the primary reasons which had been creating a lack of ecosystem as such. Now, what has changed now? The most important thing is that what we see is that 
the government is making all its efforts to act as a facilitator now and not as a roadblock. And there is a development of trust between the government and the private industry. We see that, uh, you know, uh, FDI although has been increasing on an year on year basis in this country, but the private investment has not been taking place. So I think this is going to be a big boost in terms of uh, the manufacturing business uh, taking off in this country. And yes, coming to your point, uh, that can India be a global delivery center? I feel very much we all know that we have the wherewithal in terms of the skilled uh, uh, and trained people in this country. The only issue has been a lack of creation of an ecosystem and which we see is taking a great drive forward now. And I remain pretty optimistic. And the most important thing will be that the government support needs to be uh, coming in at regular stages because they, although they have announced that they will like to finance 50% of the project cost to the eligible manufacturers. But then the point is that it also gets into the point of uh, whether the implementation is taking place in that manner. So I think uh, all, whether it is industry, whether it is government, whether it is the bank, all of them will have to work as uh, you know uh, a catalyst to each other and then we will see a major uh, flip forward which will help the economy hmm. arun mamfazi if you're there with us arun if you can hear me yes Vinip, can you hear me right arun your assessment of the situation and this new development and this new development was obviously anticipated ever since the government said there will be PLIs attributed to all those companies who are going to be taking up the business of semiconductors. But yet, according to you, what are some of the impediments? What are some of the loopholes that we still need to get over to make this dream a reality and in fact take India to that 5 trillion figure, uh, perhaps by 2025? Is semiconductor... Uh, you know, that horse that can be ridden into that uh, uh, gate of prosperity? Uh, thanks, Vinay. So, let me talk in terms of two aspects. One is the Vedanta Foxconn deal in particular, and then second overall, what India might achieve in the in the field of semiconductors. So, first of all, as far as the Vedanta Foxconn uh, JV is concerned, we still don't have a lot of details. Uh, while we should all be happy about both Indian companies as well as Taiwanese companies uh, coming together, we have to also be a little cautious. For example, Foxconn does not have silicon CMOS technology. What it has are component manufacturing as well as silicon carbide, which falls under compound semiconductors, for which also government has policies supporting up to 30% of the capex and so on. However, the cream of the cream, silicon CMOS, uh, will still need uh, another partner or another technology transfer because the government policy specifically says 28 nanometer or below or up to 65 nanometer uh, experience in running a fab or production grade technology. So in other words, we'll have to wait to find more details uh, from both the companies as to what exactly they're getting into. So this is point number one. Point number two, um, and I agree with many of the previous panelists who spoke about this, the geopolitics, the economics, as well as the policy related aspect. Currently, government is giving it a big push. There's no doubt about it. It is putting a lot of weight behind those efforts. So it should definitely lead to something substantial in the, in the coming months or years. It has also diversified its effects. There is support for design, there is support for compound semiconductor, silicon photonics and packaging bucket. And then there is display as well as finally the what I keep calling as a cream of the cream, the silicon CMOS. So we might not see a huge improvement or a development in all of this field at once. We'll have, we may have to give it some time, but one by one, we can definitely make a start. India can definitely make a start in, in some of these. Uh, the silicon CMOS is something which we'll have to still wait and see what technology nodes we might get, which players might come and show interest. However, some of the other ones which are of lesser capex intensive, uh, it is very likely to take off faster and so on. So we'll have to wait and see how this uh, pans out in in the next few months. But definitely, compared to the last two decades or so where we have been wanting to do something, the government has taken a decisive step and is pushing it like never before. Right. Uh, but but do you think that, you know, in the next five to six years, the ecosystem, the comprehensive ecosystem uh, 
Arun is going to be in fact in place or do you think there is enough not enough time you need more because this is after all a very sophisticated ecosystem that we are talking about you see no country can dream to be 100% self sufficient in terms of the semiconductor supply chain right even the recent news about if russia uh, gets impacted some of the gases that are needed and like palladium that is needed for memory and so on might get impacted so there is a huge number of pieces to this whole ecosystem so even india cannot dream of that matter us or even taiwan cannot dream to be 100% self sufficient in all of this what we may need to focus on is to try to achieve certain amount of self sufficiency especially built around the core which is the semiconductor fab the manufacturing of the fabricating units and to the extent possible build both towards the back end which is the packaging and the assembly which companies like tata electronics have already said they will be getting into as well as into the upwards of the of the supply chain in terms of design for example and maybe in future look at possibilities of let's say equipment manufacturing chemicals uh, and so on and other you know other elements of the supply chain but right now without having that core semiconductor fabs you won't be able to build the rest of the ecosystem around it so 5 to 6 years might be good enough to put in the base of that ecosystem another 5 to 10 years it might take to build the whole ecosystem but you know you have to be- make a beginning at some point and that's what the government is hoping to achieve right joyta you know in terms of uh, you know taking this industry very seriously and uh, placing india as a major stakeholder in its development in its execution as well as uh, other things involved with the semiconductors do you think that taiwan is perhaps the best partner for india to go with at this point in time there are other countries as well you know the question i'm trying to ask you is that uh, you know there is obviously political tension there is political dissension as well when it comes to associating with taiwan because you know you are challenging the one china policy uh well we need i think uh, over the years in fact especially in the recent years our trade relationship our business relationship apart from of course cultural relationship is already there it has been booming so i don't think we really need to worry about it but now let us look at it this way what has happened is you see if taiwan uh, is considered a semiconductor giant and obviously it is the number one country when it comes to semiconductors but yes now what has happened is you see much of taiwan's uh, industrialization in fact much of what has been happening in china in terms of that is because a largely uh, to an extent uh, or largely i would say because of the presence of a whole lot of taiwanese uh, companies in china and manufacturing a lot of these manufacturings are happening in china now what has been happening in the recent past especially after the whole covid thing started a lot of these european countries and especially the western countries are not happy with the idea of the semiconductor chips and all being manufactured in china so a lot of these companies are now wanting and a whole lot of other technology related companies and apparently what is also going on is you see there is some kind of pressure from the uh, communist government over there in terms of spying you know they are trying to in, uh, introduce things in these uh, semiconductors all of whatever it's basically they are trying to do this so that they are trying to use these companies for spying and that is one of the reasons why the western countries are very unhappy with the idea of made in china so now if these companies have to start moving out where do they go taiwan does not have the capacity to absorb when you look at countries in say for example like vietnam and the smaller countries of the south korea they don't have that kind of capacity to absorb uh, the pot- you know the industry if it wants to move out so india is one of the best destinations for that and also president sai yang wen i mean the taiwanese president has a something called a southbound policy and that southbound according to that southbound policy they are looking to invest at i think about 18 countries uh, in south asia and southeast asia out of which india is um, right on top so there's a huge potential and again i am going to uh, repeat if you have noticed every time there is labor trouble in india maybe even no other global uh, media outlet may be picking it up 
but the chinese definitely pick it up and the chinese they start picking it up and they start saying see india is such an unsuitable destination for anything moving out of china so this is a huge political opportunity and no just because we have a huge opportunity for us in terms of business we are not saying we are uh, against one china policy although for us to agree to i mean continue agreeing to one china policy i mean china should also agree to one india policy and not talk about uh, jammu i mean jammu kashmir being part of some there or uh, pakistan or uh, arunachal being part of china ladakh being part of china we don't follow that but i think in fact there should be reciprocal there should be reciprocity that is something we don't have but at the same time again i'm going to repeat that we have to be very careful when it comes to this because china is not liking it and there will be trouble they will create trouble they cannot uh, stop us from having business relationship with taiwan but they can create trouble in our country they can try to ensure that you know these companies shut down that there is some kind of problem so so we have to be very careful about these things okay quick closing comments Professor Agarwal, how can we insulate India's interest when it comes to all these geopolitical issues as well related to semiconductors? Because we know that is where the treasure trove is for the future. No, certainly. First of all, the important thing is you see, Taiwan is not the supreme and the best. So we are going to the second level as of today in terms of building it up. But that is required if we really want to kick start it and go forward. and uh, you know i don't see those troubles your political troubles which are there in terms of uh, moving forward uh, specifically because of the fact that you know india has the capability to shield itself the way the government has taken initiative in terms of taking track and keeping record of the foreign direct investment which is now invested in india in the last 3 years in particular and the way the banking system has stabilized and strengthened itself in the last 3 4 years i think is clear indication of the fact that you know we cannot be just rumbled up and anyone can just walk in and do start doing things as used to be the case in the past firstly secondly i have been to taiwan twice and i've been uh, to china multiple times invited by their government to address there is a clear cut uh, you know uh, dis- you know clear cut divide between both these countries although it is a uh, one china kind of a thing but still it's a clear cut divide the policy framework of both the countries works independently taiwan does not allow china to intervene and do things so and as far as global players are concerned i think india enjoys the best positive uh, you know outlay whether it comes at world bank imf world economic forum oecd you talk of the forum i think we are uh, performing extremely well the way whether it is financial inclusion and the fact that the current budget 2022 clearly outlays a large chunk of framework on digital platform and digital structures so this is clear if we want those things to happen if nirmala sitaraman wants that to happen if the way they want transparency accountability and sustainability to come in through digital strike startup we have no option to move into these frameworks and go forward it's a beginning the ecosystem will develop with time 5 years is a very long duration if we really want to go forward and if we want to create that dream which we want to create for india at 100 we need to kick start it and go forward much faster i okay. hope more companies come forward in terms of collaborating right. at different levels and scopes in terms of building up this because this is a very important factor for supply chain structures in india Absolutely. for semiconductor we've, we've run out of time professor agarwal quick closing comments from mr kapoor and arun 30 seconds to each one of you and then we wrap up Yogendra, coming to you first. Right, Vinay. The only bottleneck in this entire system, I feel, is the management of the labor issues, where they will have to be put at rest and beyond the domestic politics, and wherein I see that the central government as well as the state governments will have to be coming on one page, and then only I feel that the entire, uh, you know, this uh, system will work to the benefit of this country. Okay, Arun. Yeah. So quickly, uh, government has made a good beginning, and now industries in India are also increasingly showing interest. But let us also understand that it is going to be a big effort to get it all in place and the ecosystem to be in place. So let's also be patient. We've all concurred and said, and used the phrase that uh, it's a good beginning, and like they say, well begun is half done. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this wonderful conversation. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.